shapes are similar. So moving on, uh, we'll define the orthocenter of a triangle. I think this should be quite known to the majority of people here, but anyway, uh, it's one of the most crucial centers of the triangle. In any three, given any three points A, B, and C, if we draw a line through one vertex perpendicular to the opposite side of the triangle, then those three lines will concur. So here we have altitudes AD, AD is perpendicular to BC, BE, which is perpendicular to AC, and CF, which is perpendicular to AB. And we see that they all pass through the same point H. It's customary to denote the orthocenter by H for, I, for whatever reason, I believe it's not denoted by O because O is already used for the circumcenter in general. So anyway, here's our actual statement of the nine point circle. This is what the theorem, which we'll spend the majority of the talk proving actually says. It says, if we have a triangle ABC, it doesn't matter whether it's obtuse or acute or isosceles or anything. And it has altitudes A, D, B, E, and C, F, such that D lies on B, C, and similarly for points E and F. And we let M, N, and P respectively denote the midpoints of sides B, C, C, A, A, B, so the sides opposite A, B, and C. And then finally, we let M sub A, M sub B, and M sub C be the midpoints of the segments A, H, B, H, and C, H. And then uh, the theorem states, that the nine points D, E, F, M, N, P, and M sub A, M sub B, M sub C all lie on the same circle. And the statement of this theorem, I think, is pretty incredible and somewhat surprising because very often it's uh, interesting enough to find four points which happen to lie on the same circle. Uh, like, we'll show a cyclic quadrilateral here. Very often, we'll see problems that will ask to prove the concentricity of just four points. And in this theorem, we actually have nine. So it's a much stronger result than we might have. And cyclic quadrilaterals are very, very important in Olympiad geometry in the same way that I would guess more than 50% of um expected value questions will use linearity of expectation. The majority of Olympiad geometry problems will involve some cyclic quadrilateral in some way, shape, or form. And so to help, we'll provide a diagram for this statement. This is the, a very nice triangle in that angle A is roughly 60 degrees, angle B roughly 70, and angle C roughly 50. Uh, this is sort of the classic triangle, which uh, usually, if you're drawing your first diagram on a problem, you'd want your triangle to look something like this, just because it usually, it covers all bases of being just random enough that you won't get a special taste most of the time. So anyway, we have the altitudes AD, BE, and CF. We have the midpoints M, N, and P, and we have these the midpoints connecting of the segments connecting the orthocenter to the vertices. And they all lie on the same circle. So in order to make the proof as brief as possible, uh, I don't want to deal with the two separate cases of uh, obtuse and acute. So I'll just show here quickly that the theorem does indeed hold when it's the triangle is obtuse and show sort of the intuitive explanation of why. Uh, Chirag Saman Taroy asks, sorry, but could you briefly go back to the definition of a nine-point circle? I couldn't quite catch that. Oh, sure. Um, basically, if we have, I guess the diagram is probably slightly easier. So we have a triangle here. We draw the line through A perpendicular to BC. It meets at D. We draw the midpoint of BC, and we symmetrically define the pairs EN and PF. And finally, we have assume the existence of the orthocenter, that's pretty straightforward to prove, and we draw the midpoints of the segments connecting the orthocenter to the three vertices, and then the nine-point circle is the circle containing all nine of these points. D, M, M sub, sub C, N, E, M sub A, P, F, and M sub B.
should I didn't ask the question. Uh, we're just showing the example now where we have an obtuse triangle. So the author center is here. It lies outside the triangle in this case. So again, we draw the midpoints of the three sides, and then we draw the midpoints to net in D to the vertices. I'm not worried about the labels being exactly the same. So in this case, we would have these nine points. Uh, yeah, we would have these nine points concurrent where we also draw in a feed of the altitude. T sorry, not concurrent, in cyclic. And there's there is a formal way of explaining why the this works. Only what we can say just intuitively is note that B is the author center of triangle DAC. And then if we assume that we've proven the nine point circle in the acute case, then the concentricity of these nine points follows directly from that. So basically it just makes use of the fact that author centers come in pairs. And then obviously there are some quite annoying cases where the triangle will be isosceles or equilateral even, but those are not really that crucial and we'll just leave those as an exercise. They should, it should be doable given the proof we provide here. So now we'll actually get into proving the distance of the circle. So as stated above, we can assume in good conscience that our triangle is both acute and scaling, meaning every angle is less than 90 degrees and no two sides are equal. And yeah, the other cases can be handled pretty much the same way. So we'll first state this theorem. I think it's a very critical result. I think most of you should know this. But anyway, it states that if we have four points A, B, C, and D on a circle, then the directed angle ABC and the directed angle BCD sum to 180 degrees. Now, in we we use directed angles for formality because if we have a, a, a concave case like this, it will be a bit different. But in the most natural case is when the quadrilateral is convex, and we can see that if we label and or ABD and and or BCD. 60.4, 119.6, those two sum to 180. And if we move A around, we can do whatever we want with it. 54.7, 125.3, those also sum to 180. And the main reason we use directed handles, uh, the main reason why most people use directed handles, I think, is that it, they basically get rid of configuration issues. So if we take handles modulo 180 degrees, then we don't have to worry about an annoying case when the set when the segments AC and BD do not intersect. I think for a long time, contestants would typically just write without loss of generality, we can assume the following diagram. And then for whatever reason, graders decided that wasn't good enough. So now everyone just directs handles and that negates any issues, I think. So we'll use this theorem, and this is an if and only if statement, which means that if this relation is true, then the four points A, B, C, and D must lie on a circle. So now we'll prove the following lemma. So let's say we have a triangle A, B, C, and we have its author center H here. I'll actually draw it with labels, just to make it a bit easier to understand. I put B on the left this time, but it doesn't matter that much. Um, I think that's standard. Okay, so we label its author center here. And we reflect H over the side BC. Now, can someone just quickly type in the chat what's interesting about the reflection of point H over side BC. Sorry about this. We see that the points A, H, D, and H prime, the reflection of H over the side BC, or are collinear, except that won't always happen. So can someone just type in the chat 
why why that is. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, because a AH is perpendicular to BC, and by definition, H H prime is also perpendicular to BC. So those and the line through H perpendicular to BC is obviously unique. So those four points must be concurrent. Collinear. Sorry. Anyway, now we can move on with the proof a bit. I labeled it H prime here, H sub A here. It doesn't matter particularly. And the claim is that the four points A, B, H prime, and C lie on the same circle. So if I draw the circum circle of triangle ABC, it will contain this point. I'll dash it just so we don't confuse ourselves and think that we've already proven that. Um, so since we just went over theorem one, it seems like we're gonna apply that here. And if we just looked at this diagram quickly. Um, there's one and or relation which one an experienced uh, an experienced contestant might see very quickly, but here in this sort of diagram it might not jump out. So I'll just draw a couple of triangles and that should make well the and or equality a bit clearer. So what do we notice about this orange triangle and this blue triangle? Again, feel free to type in chat. Yeah. Okay, thank you. It's they they are congruent. Um, the reason for that is shied BC is shared, and H prime is the reflection of H over BC. So BH is equal to BH prime, and CH is equal to CH prime, and then SSS congruency gives those triangles to be equal. So that means that their correspondent parts or or andors are also equal. So and or B H prime C is equal to and or B H C here. They're both 120.1. And this will hold for any location of A. You can see that they'll always have the same measure. Right. So we want to prove the condition that the and or B H prime C and the and or BAC sum to 180. Only since these two andors are equal, that's equivalent to proving that and or BHC and and or BAC sum to 180. And now we can, the remainder of the proof follows from some very basic and or JSON. So I typed up the formal right up here. We have that the and or BHC is equal to 180 minus the sum of and or HBC and and or HCB. So this, this and or here, and this and or here. Can someone just type in the chat why that equality holds? Um, it's not, it, it doesn't need to be that complicated. Uh, right triangles would probably work. Yeah. Uh, Sense. The sum of the sum of the angles in a triangle is one eighty degrees. That's one of one of the most important results from which a lot of angle chasing is based. So that allows us to make that substitution there. Then we have this perpendicularity of H D and B C. So this angle is equal to ninety degrees minus and or uh, sorry. Yeah, that's equal to ninety degrees minus and or C from this right triangle. I'll shade it here. Uh, just put in a different color. And symmetrically, the other right triangle gives and or HCB as 90 minus B. So we can make those two substitutions. And then we can simplify quite a bit. We get some nice cancellation. And that's equal to B plus C, which is 180 minus A, uh, for the same reason that Srinath gave that the sum of the angles in a triangle is 180. Okay. So now we'll get into sort of the second part of the proof here. And it shouldn't be too hard given the result we proved in lemma one. So the statement is this. We delete 
the majority of points in the diagram. We draw the midpoint of BC. I'll get the points right this time to avoid confusion. And yeah, if you if you guys have questions, just let me know uh, if I'm going too fast or anything. So here we've reflected H over point M. That just means the point on ray HM such that M at sub A is equal to MH. And they're obviously collinear. And the claim now is that the certum circle of ABC will also pass through the point at sub A. And we can see if we draw it, it does indeed pass through that desired point. Now, I'm going to draw a quadrilateral or shaded quadrilateral here and just type in the chat what it looks like. Yes, correct. It is a parallelogram. And the proof of this is pretty straightforward. Uh, the T, one of the T facts of a parallelogram is that its diagonals will bisect one another. Uh, we see that M is the midpoint of BC. So at H, at sub A, H clearly bisects the diagonal BC. And by the definition of the reflection, M is the midpoint of H at sub A. So the diagonal BC clearly bisects diagonal H at sub A. And that's actually enough to show straight from there it is a parallelogram. Now, what do we know about opposite angles in a parallelogram? Again, you can type in chat. The sum isn't 180 for opposite angles. It is for adjacent angles. Yes, they're equal. So we can set angle B at sub AC equal to and or B, BHC or CHB, doesn't matter. And what do we know about and or BHC from the first lemma? Well, the first lemma we proved here that and or BHC is the supplement of and or A. So now we have that and or BAC is supplementary to BHC, which is equal to B at sub AC. So Andor's BAC and B at sub AC are supplementary. We've shown, uh, by assuming that ABC was acute and staline, we know that the quadrilateral AB at sub AC is convex. And from theorem one, we know that if the Andor's in a convex quadrilateral, if opposite Andor's are supplementary, then the four points of the quadrilateral must lie on the same circle. And as three points determine a circle uniquely, that finishes the proof. That gives points A, B, et sub A, and C considered. Yeah, here's the write-up. It's very short given lemma one. So now we'll try and see why any of this stuff was actually helpful. So if we look at this diagram, we proved that H sub A and et sub A lie on the certum circle. And then I constructed the symmetric points H sub B, et sub B, H sub C, and et sub C. And it's perfectly legal for me to say just straight from the existence of this, these two points on the certum circle that these four points also lie on the certum circle. And the reason for this is just symmetry. There was nothing special about vertex A. There was nothing to distinguish uh, point M from point N. So the proof that these four would lie on the circle is symmetric to the first two. So this diagram should look somewhat similar to the diagram above, which provides the statement of the nine-point circle. Uh, I deliberately like shaded it the same way just to make it pop out, I think. But there's a point here that sort of seems like the odd one out. And can someone type in the chat which point this would be? What I'm saying is that we in this diagram, I think we have maybe like 19 points, but one of them doesn't really seem to fit 
with the rest of them. It has no symmetric counterpart. Which one would that be? Well, it's not P, because there's nothing really to distinguish P from points N or M. I'm looking for a point which has no symmetric counterpart. Yes, H. The point H cannot be rotated or to be considered symmetric to any other point. It's It stands alone. Vertex, the vertices A, B, and C are all basically equivalent. The points M, N, and P are all essentially the same, and so on for the other sets of three points. So we'll have a look at the two diagrams side by side. They do look very similar compared in this light. And now we can go back to the first definition of homothody. So if we had to choose a center of homothody to sort of morph the diagram on the right to the diagram on the left, which point would we want its center to be? Yes, we again want to center it at H. And we see here, uh, at sub C multiplied by one half is equal to the distance HP. And similarly for the distance H, H sub A and the distance HD. So that might give us a hint as to the dilation ratio of this homothetic transformation. Uh, the ratio is going to be one half. So we know that these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine points lie on the same circle. And that already should remind us of the nine point circle just from the same number of points. Now, what happens if we dilate about H with positive, with ratio positive one half? Where does H sub A go, for example? It goes to D. We know that it's the reflection of H over side BC. So this distance HD is equal to the distance H sub AD. So D is the midpoint, and that is all there is to it. Similarly, for the H sub I's, if we take the midpoint of the segment H at sub I, it will correspond to the midpoint of one of the three sides for I being A, B, or C, just so we don't lose track of the symmetricness of this diagram. Finally, what happens if we actually dilate the vertices themselves with respect to H with ratio one half? Where do they go? They should go to the midpoints of the segments to net in the vertices to the orthocenter. And that is particularly nice because we defined M sub A, M sub B, and M sub C to be those exact points. So we've just proven that if we dilate the circumcircle of ABC about H with dilation ratio positive one half, the circumcircle of ABC, which contains these nine points, will be transformed to the circumcircle of MNP or the nine point circle of ABC, which contains the nine points which we wanted. And so here's a formal write up of that proof. So yeah, just take a second, uh, compare the two diagrams side by side, ask me if you have any questions, but this should confirm the existence. Uh, could someone just let me know if anything gets typed in chat? I don't want to switch screen. Oh yeah, I can read out chat to you. Yes. Um, Uh, Sahiba Kaur asks, so the circumcircle has twice the radius of the nine-point circle because then because of dilation. Yes, that's exactly what I'm getting into next. So let's actually draw the this, this most important point in a, of a circle, its center. I'll do this on GeoGebra because it's faster. Uh, Alex Kaneko asks, so the nine-point circle is basically a circumcircle of the medial triangle? Yes. But it's also the certum circle of the author triangle, which makes it very nice. So let's draw the nine point circle. Let's actually draw the center of the certum circle of ABC. 
and the nine point circle. So we have these three points, G, H, and I, which I would call irreplaceable. They can't be considered symmetric with respect to any other point on the diagram. So what do we notice about these three points? There are two properties I'd say that are quite nice. Yeah, feel free to type in chat and then if someone uh, could like. Yeah. Orion Jenna says H, I, and G look collinear. They are. Oh, you might want to call it something other than I because I is in center. Oh, yeah, that's, that's fair. I'll call it N. Well, okay. I'll... And I'll call G O so it's not confused with the centroid. Yeah, so since we dilated with respect to H, and n and o is obviously mapped to n under the dilation we see that these three points must be collinear by the definition of homothety but there's something else interesting remember the ratio of the dilation it was positive one half what does that mean about the distances hn and ho uh Aryan jenna and sahiba kor say n is a midpoint of ho yes exactly Hn will be half of Ho, which is equivalent to N being the midpoint. And as someone said earlier, it means that the radius of the nine-point circle will be exactly half the radius of the certain circle. So yeah, just uh, take a look at this diagram for a second. The fact that N lies on uh, OH is very important to the first problem we'll look at. Okay, I think that's enough. Um, all right, so I wanted to get into some sort of deeper results in Olympiad geometry, but that's impossible without this following theorem. Uh, it states that the radical axis of, if we have two circles, I'm assuming that you know what the power of a point with respect to a circle is. If we have two circles, the radical axis of the two circles is the unique line uh, which consisting of the set of points P such that the power of P with respect to one circle is equal to the power of P with respect to the other circle. Uh, the proof that it's a line, I'm not gonna get into. I don't know especially beautiful geometric approach. The best I can do is probably uh, just straight perpendicularity lemma, which is a constituent of the Pythagorean theorem and then intermediate value, which I don't wanna get into. So there are four points in this diagram. We have this circle centered at C, this circle centered at A. They intersect the points D and E. What is the radical axis of these two circles? It's a line, to, it's a line made up of two of the four points here. Did anyone type in chat? Uh, yeah. Aryan Jenna says DE. DE, yeah, perfect. The reason for that is that D has power zero with respect to both circles, so it lies on the radical axis. E also has power zero with respect to either circle, so it also lies on the radical axis. And two points uniquely determine a line, so DE must be the radical axis. Uh, Ari and Jenna also asks, what if the two circles do not intersect? If they don't intersect, then the radical axis still exists. As long as the circles are not concentric, uh, the radical axis will exist, but it will be a bit more annoying to construct. But we can construct it using the following theorem, which we'll present here. So the key, what's interesting about the radical axes of circles is that if we take three circles, their pairwise radical axes are concurrent. Sorry, they're not equivalent. So let's draw one circle here, one circle here, and one circle here. And the proof of their concurrency is actually fairly straightforward, given that the theorem is usually considered quite advanced. It's analogous to the proof of the existence of the certum center. If we let this one intersect this one here, we, sorry, we don't know about this line yet. Then L has equal power with respect to these two circles. It also has equal power with respect to these two circles. So by the transitive property, probably the most intuitive of results, it must have equal power with respect to this circle and this circle. 
So it lies on this radical axis too. And in response to the question, how do we construct the radical axis if we don't know about the intersection points of the circles or they don't exist? We have a circle here and a circle here. I'll draw a circle which intersects both circles. We let their radical axes meet at some point here. By the radical axis theorem, point J must have equal power with respect to this one and this circle. And another fact about the radical axis is that it will always be perpendicular to the line joining the centers of the two respective circles. So then we just construct the line through J perpendicular to AD, and this will be the desired radical axis. Now, I'm going to quickly go over one of the nicer applications later, but first we'll go through, I, I called this an easy application, but in contest, this would obviously be much more tricky to solve. This was given as number problem one of the 2017 TSTST. I, it's one of the most advanced US contests. So the fact that the proof here is so short is pretty astounding. So the statement is, we let ABC be a triangle with certum circle gamma, certum center O, and ortho center H. We assume that AB is not equal to AC and that angle A is not equal to 90 degrees. This gets rid of possible degenerate cases and points at infinity. We let M and N be the midpoints of sides A, B, and AC. We let E and F be the feet of the altitudes from B and C. And we draw the line to, through A tangent to gamma and let it intersect the A midline MN at point P. Finally, we let Q be the intersection point other than A of gamma with the certum circle of ABC, AEF. This uniquely defines Q as it can't be A by this condition, and two non two distinct circles can intersect that at most two points. And then we let R be the intersection of AQ with EF. And the problem asks to prove that PR is perpendicular to OH. Now, there's one point here that sort of seems, I guess there are two points, but one of them actually is very relevant. There's a point here which seems out of place. Can someone type in the chat just a guess as to what that point would be? Like it's it's not used in very many of the definitions here. Orion Jenna asks H. Yes, perfect. H is only used here and at the very end. Uh, what do we know about the line OH? What other point does it contain? Arian Jenna says the nine point center. Yes, N, the nine point center. Oh, sorry, we already used N. Uh, I'll call it K. We haven't used that yet, I think. Okay, so here's a diagram. He asks, can we please have a diagram? Oh, yeah, there's yeah. a diagram. <laughs> I wouldn't expect you guys to visualize this problem. OK, so the problem was pretty intimidating when I first looked at it. I don't think I solved this correctly when I tried it. Uh, but anyway, here's a perfect diagram with asymptote. Should make it a lot easier to visualize. So I deleted O and K, the nine point center, from the picture because I want to focus on the line PR. So we stated that the radical axis of two circles was perpendicular to the line joining their centers. So we want to show that PR is the radical axis of two circles. We got rid of the points K and O. Those were the centers of the nine-point circle and certum circle. So it would make sense to prove that, K, that the line PR is that radical axis of the certum circle of DEFMN, or the nine-point circle, and gamma the certum circle of ABC. So how will we do that? We'll show that they both have equal power with respect to either circle. And that will finish the proof because two points determine a line. So let's look at the certum circle of AMN. We know that the line MN is parallel to BC. What does that mean about the certum circle of AMN?
if people would type their response in the chat, that would be great. Uh, Jerry Leong says, tangent to the circumcircle of ABC. Uh, yes. That's not true. Wait, Wait. That, that, that is true. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, it's fine. Uh, so, yes, down to you. The circumcircle of AMN is tangent to the circumcircle of ABC. So that means that the line PA is tangent to both circles. And thus, PA is the radical axis of the circumcircle of AMN and the circumcircle of ABC. So that means that PA squared is equal to PM times PN. That's just power of a point. But we know that M and N lie on the nine point circle. So PM times PN is actually the power of P with respect to the nine point circle as well. And that's nice. That means that P has equal power with respect to the circum circle of ABC and the nine point circle. So that's one point out of the way. And it turns out the point R is even easier. If we just look at the radical center of the circum circle of A, Q, E, F, H, the circum circle of A, B, C, and the nine point circle, we see that A, Q is the radical axis of the two formerly mentioned circles, and E, F is the radical axis of the purple circle and the dashed circle. So they meet at R, so R must have equal power with respect to the circum circle and the nine point circle as well. And it turns out that's the full proof. It's a very short solution for what is meant to be a very challenging problem. I don't think a lot of people had much trouble with this because there was also a solution with Barry Centrics. But I think this is definitely more instructive and harder to actually see in contest. But still, it's a very nice problem. So to close the talk, I want to uh, present an original problem I came up with, uh, mainly because anything else you could just find on art of problem solving. You wouldn't really need me to explain it. Uh, so it, it actually uses radical axis again. I'll give that much away. But I think it's still pretty pretty to solve. It impl I think it uses the tool a bit more discreetly. So uh, first, we'll just show something with the radical axis. So what happens if I make the radius of the circle centered at D incredibly small? If I make it infinitely small, it basically becomes a point, except you can see with the diagram, the radical axis still exists even as we take the radius to become infinitely small. So this means that we can sort of push the radical axis theorem to the degenerate case where the circle D doesn't even technically exist and it's just a point. OK, so now I'll get into the problem. I'll draw the diagram first so people can visualize it better. We have a triangle ABC. Oh, OK, whatever. I'll work with this. So we define point P as the point on the ray DE such that PA is perpendicular to the PB, to, sorry, to AB. And we symmetrically define Q. Now the problem is asking, no, that's not right. Uh, yeah. What the problem is asking is if we intersect the lines PQ and BC and let them meet at T, and then we define M as the midpoint of BC to show that and or MAT is equal to 90. So we'll do that quickly. So yeah, if they intersect at the point T over here, then the and or TAM or MAT, same thing, will indeed be 90 degrees. Uh, one might notice that this opens up rotation, given that AD is perpendicular to BC. I think the majority of people I showed this problem to 
uh, used projection, which is a nice solution in itself, but less elementary. So how? let's like just look at the point T for a second. If we reverse engineer the problem, which is usually a good strategy, I think uh, most we often redefine points when working with problems just to make just to allow us to use certain facts, which will be helpful. I think most recently, 2019 Usajmo problem three lended itself pretty well to this that strategy. Yeah, if we redefine this point T as the intersection of the line perpendicular to AM through A with BC, and then we know this handle is 90. Uh, uh, we Alex, call, sorry, Alex, what? can I go ask, what's E again? E? Oh, that's just the foot of the altitude from B to AC. Similarly for F. So if we draw the circumcircle of ADM, and we draw the nine-point circle, then we might notice that the circumcircle of ADM has diameter AM since ADM is equal to 90 degrees. Thus, its center lies on segment AM, it's the midpoint. And so the perpendicular through A to AM will be tangent. So that means that TA is the tangent to ADM. So can someone just type in the chat what TA squared is equal to? This one's a bit harder. Did anyone do it? Uh, Orion Jenna says power of point T. Alex Kaneko says AD times AM. Uh, like the first one, yes, but what other quantity is it equal to? Uh, Alex Kaneko says he meant TD times TM. Yes, that's correct. It's equal to TD times TM. So that's the power of T with respect to the circumcircle of ADM, but points D and M also lie on the nine-point circle, so it's equivalently the power of T with respect to the nine-point circle. Uh, is there another circle in this diagram, or not circle, rather? But is there something else in this diagram such that TA squared is the power of T with respect to that object? August Deer asks circumcircle? Uh, no, not the circumcircle. Uh, that would imply that the circumcenter lies on AM, which is not true. Uh, if no one gets it soon, I'll just say... Uh, I guess the last hint would be to think back about what we last talked about with the radical axis. Anyone? Yeah, thanks for the hint. Augustus Deer asks point A. Yes, perfect. If we look at the point A, the circle centered at point A with radius zero, then TA squared is the power of T with respect to that circle. So we've just shown that T lies on the radical axis of that degenerate circle of A and the nine-point circle of ABC. So if we were to prove that points P and Q belong to that same radical axis, then we'd be done. And now we can delete T from the picture. And we get this nicer diagram. So if we draw the circumcircle of A, E, D, that passes through B because it has diameter A, B, then what do we notice about P, A? Remember the condition that A, P was perpendicular to A, B.
Uh, Luke C says P A is tangent to A B. Gary Liang also says tangent. Yeah, perfect. So that means that P A squared is the power of uh, P with respect to the degenerate circle A, but it's also the power of P with respect to the circle with diameter A B. But D and E lie on the latter circle, so P D times P E is the power of P with respect to the nine point circle. It's also the power of P with respect to the circum circle of A E D B. And it's also the power of P with respect to the degenerate circle A. So P is the radical center of those three circles. It certainly belongs to the radical axis. Uh, by symmetry, we can say that Q lies on that radical axis also. So P Q is the radical axis of point A and the nine point circle. And that we know passes through T, so we're done. So yeah, here's a formal write-up of that. I deleted P from the picture because, as you can see here, it goes very far away from the triangle, and I didn't want the important part of the picture to be too plotted. But yeah, this is probably the fastest write-up, I think. OK, so that concludes uh, everything I have, uh, everything I, I have. Uh, if anyone has any questions for me uh, about the topic or otherwise, feel free to type in chat and I'd be happy to answer. All right. Uh, oh, my favorite math competition, math topic. Uh, I would definitely be Euclidean geometry this year. I've gotten more into some uh, sort of number theory topics as well, but I'm. It's still just plain geometry. I really like uh, lots of circles in the diagram. I'm. Yeah, my favorite problems are usually usually somewhat similar to the two I presented today. Uh, sure, I can share it. I think I'll probably post it to the Art of Problem Solving website in a set uh, as soon as this is over, and you can see it there. Uh, I think we'll also be sending it out as well, as well as the recording, so yeah. Okay, sure. All right. Okay, if uh, that's all the questions, then that's all I have for you. Thanks again for attending, and yeah. All right. Can we have a round of applause? All right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Sir.